Turn with me to Mark chapter 14. Mark chapter 14, we're going to uh, begin our study today at verse 27. Resurrection Sunday. Hallelujah. Amen. <laughs> we are moving toward the fulfillment of uh, so much prophecy. And indeed, our study today, and uh, I'm prepared to go through verse 42, but I have a, a sneaky suspicion we're not going to get that far. <laughs> yeah, it's. You know, the, the death and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ was a direct frontal assault upon Satan's schemes and plans to not just encapture and slave mankind, but to destroy mankind. You understand that, that the cross was God's shot into time and space that says, no, Satan. You're not going to win this battle. Amen. Amen. Well, we concluded our study last time together. Verse 26, notice it says, After singing a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. So that was the last supper that has been concluded and conducted in Jesus and his disciples, minus Judas. As I shared with you some of the, the uh, synoptic gospels, some of the parallel passages that Judas took off. Jesus said, what you do, do quickly, and he got up and left. So Jesus and the 11 would have left the upper room. They walked through the city streets of Jerusalem, through the eastern gate, down the road, across the Kidron Brook. And by the way, I've made this, this point many, many times before, but the Kidron Brook that ran through the Kidron Valley would have been blood red because all of the blood from the temple sacrifices found its way to down the valley and into the Kidron Brook. And so as Jesus is leading the 11 down through the valley and across the brook, the brook is running red. And then up the slope of the Mount of Olives to what we're going to see today, the Garden of Gethsemane. And uh, we'll cover as much as we can today, making our way through this narrative. There are so many nuggets of truth um, that as I was reading and praying and thinking about this passage, so many words of exhortation and even a few words of warning for us today. So they have concluded what we refer to as the Last Supper. Verses 27 and 28 then begin our text for today. And Jesus said to them, to the eleven, You will all fall away because it is written, I will strike down the shepherd and the sheep shall be scattered. But after I have been raised, I will go ahead of you. How's that? Is that all you got, Satan? <laughs> Bring it. We're all blood-bought, spirit-filled, born-again, redeemed believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's all you got? Mess with our PA? Go away already. So Jesus, on the way to the Garden of Gethsemane, engages the disciples. Notice here that he takes the initiative. Jesus takes the initiative, verse 27. He said to them, and what he said to them, rather matter-of-factly, shocks them. Let's read it again. He said to them, you will all fall away because it is written, I will strike down the shepherd and the sheep shall be scattered but after I've been raised I will go ahead of you to Galilee now that shocked them and I know that it shocked them because of what we read notice what it says in verse 29 but Peter said to him 
Even though all may fall away, yet I will not. And then jump down to verse 31. But Peter kept saying insistently, even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And they were all saying the same thing. All of them. So they were very surprised at what Jesus had to say. Now, there are a few things that I want to point out here about this passage that demands our attention today. First of all, in verse 27, there are two key words, two key words in verse 27. They are, in my opinion, all, and then a phrase, because it is written. He says, you will all fall away because it is written. So what are we seeing here? Well, we're seeing, first of all, directly on the surface as we look at this text, we're seeing the foreknowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is seeing the future because he knows the future, and he says, you're all going to fall away. Every one of you are going to fall away. Now, that shocked them, and, and so Peter in his bravado says, that's never going to happen, Lord. Even if I have to die, I'm not going to fall away which I find very, very interesting. And we'll get to that in a minute. But it also demonstrates the omniscience of the Lord Jesus Christ. See, some people say, well, when Jesus was a man, he gave up everything that made him God. <clears throat> Wrong answer. He was the God-man. He was the God-man. And so he still had the ability to know his omniscience, his all-knowingness, if that's a word. But notice something else. That, that phrase, because it is written, that makes him a prophet. Because what was he referring to? In verse 27, he actually quotes a passage of Scripture. And I find that just, I love that when it shows up in the scripture. Jesus giving prophecy. Why? Because that's the word of God interpreting the word of God. <laughs> Don't you love that? I do. I absolutely love that. The word of God is saying, here's what the word of God means. And he takes a passage, by the way, in verse 27, some of your Bibles may tell you this. If you have reference Bibles, then it tells you this. That's a passage of Scripture from the prophet Zechariah, chapter 13 and verse 7. And so Jesus is saying, listen, what is about to happen to me and you, you 11, what is about to happen was written long beforehand. Actually, the prophet Zechariah spoke of this, and the application, the meaning of it, is about to unfold. That's fantastic, don't you think? I love that. And this is what that passage says. Zechariah 13, 7 says this, Awake, O sword, against my shepherd and against the man. My associate declares the Lord of hosts. Strike the shepherd that the sheep may be scattered, and I will turn my hand against the little ones. Jesus says, that's about to happen. The Lord of hosts in Zechariah 13, 7 is whom? God the Father, right? He is Yahweh, God the Father. And the shepherd, also called by the Father, my associate is whom? Jesus, the Son of God, Messiah, Jesus Christ. So the Father is saying, He is going to strike the Son. I am going to strike the shepherd. And Jesus says to the disciples, that's me and that's you. This is about to happen. The disciples are whom? The sheep that are about to be scattered. They are the little ones. Now, this is speaking of persecution, right? 
Speaking of persecution, and we know from the scriptures that the disciples were persecuted even to the point of death. And I won't go through if they suffered um, their particular deaths. Do that research on your own. It's a very interesting study on how each of them uh, were martyred, with the exception of whom? John. John lived a long and full life. Now, Jesus had already told them that. You remember our study through Mark chapter 13, when they came out of the, the temple after that day of combating with the Pharisees and the scribes and the Sadducees, and one of the disciples who was unnamed in Mark's gospel said, see, all these beautiful buildings, and Jesus said, listen, let me tell you something. The day's coming when that's going to be destroyed. And so the disciples said, well, when's that going to happen? What's the sign of all of that and of your return and all of that? Remember? And so he went into this whole, really, he covered all of history. And he gave them a passage, verses 13 through the end of the chapter, verse 37 or so of, of Mark 13, when he told them, this is what will happen in the last days. These things. And the thing he talked about there was persecution. And so it was a reminder of them. The disciples, I believe, learned this lesson very, very well. When it says here in verse 27, when Jesus makes the application to himself and to them that Yahweh, the Father, would strike the shepherd, that was something that they never forgot. Turn with me quickly, and we'll see this in Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2 I want to show you this because this became a central focus of their ministry. The disciples, after Jesus had been raised and ascended to heaven, the disciples remembered this truth that Jesus had taught them. The Lord of hosts, Yahweh, would strike the sun. Acts chapter 2, amen? Oh, wait a moment. Acts chapter 2, amen? That's better. Verse 22, notice it says, and this is what? This is Peter's sermon at Pentecost, right? Men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs which God performed through him in your midst. Remember, that was what Nicodemus said when he came to the Lord Jesus by night and said, hey, we know that you've come from God. Because nobody does the things that you do unless he was sent by God. And he was talking about the miracles, the signs and the wonders and all of those things. And so Peter says, just as you yourselves know, this man delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of the Jewish religious leaders. Not what it says. What's it say? God. God delivered Jesus over. It was his plan before time that Jesus would be the Messiah. That just as we sang this morning all of those beautiful, wonderful lyrics, it was God's determined plan that he would strike the shepherd on our behalf. You nailed, Peter continues, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. But God raped that's one of the grandest phrases in all of Scripture. But God. But God. You meant it for this, but God. But God raised him up again, putting an end to the agony of death since it was impossible for him to be held in its power. Hallelujah. He is risen. Amen. Hallelujah. Back to Mark chapter 14. Let's, con let's continue this. So that's, that's the first point. This is demonstrating Jesus' foreknowledge, his om, om, omniscience, his prophetic word, all of those things we see just in that one statement. Secondly, notice that it says in verse 28, but after I have been raised, I will go ahead of you to Galilee. You know, it's so easy just to read right over verses and not stop and pause and consider and contemplate and let those things sink in. You've heard me say how many, well, you can't count. There aren't any throwaway words in the scripture. Every 
word in the scripture is important. Jesus goes with us, before us, to equip us for the challenges that he knows we're going to face. We don't know them, but he knows them. The place where we're going, where, where trouble will become reality, guess what? He's already there. He's gone before you. You see, here's something we need to consider. God is not restrained by time. The past, present, and the future is all the same to him. He sees our struggles, and he sees the things that we're going to be faced with, and he's already there. He's gone before you. That's important for us to remember. The disciples didn't grasp the significance of those words at the time. I'm sure they went in one ear and right out the other. But they would after Jesus rose from the dead. And I'll show you that in just a moment. Now, the third thing that I want you to see, and this really starts in verse 29, verses 29 through 31, and, and let's read this whole thing. Peter said to Jesus... Even though all may fall away, yet I will not. And Jesus said to him, Truly I say to you that this very night, before a rooster crows twice, you yourself will deny me three times. Notice Peter, so bold, <laughs> so deaf. But Peter kept saying, verse 31, insistently, what does that tell us? He's arguing with the Lord. But Peter kept saying insistently, even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And they were all saying the same thing. Here's the word of warning. Boasting does a little more than feed the flesh. Boasting does little more than create a sense of false security. Boasting really creates a self-assurance that has no place in the life of a believer when we're talking about leaning upon the Lord. 30, verse 31 is an amazing admission when you read it. Peter kept insistently saying or arguing with the Lord. Why is it an amazing admission? Well, Mark's gospel was based on whose testimony? Peter's. Peter was the primary source for Mark's gospel. Mark didn't witness these things. Peter told him after the fact. And what I think is amazing about this is that by the time of the writing of this gospel and, and Peter is sharing with Mark all that happened, Peter had learned the importance of humility. He didn't know it at the time. And that's why he was always sticking his foot in his mouth. That's why he was always arguing with the Lord. That's why Jesus had to tell him, Peter, only he addressed him as Satan, get behind me, Satan. Well, that was Peter's bravado. That was his boasting. That was his self-assurance. Peter learned humility and awareness of his own weakness. And so he told Mark all the details. Listen, I even went so far as, as I said this to our Lord. <laughs> See, remember, this is, this is after Christ has ascended. Years after. And Peter's looking back and reflecting on all of these things. I'm sure it didn't make it into the gospel, but I'm sure Peter told Mark, listen, I, I, can you believe I tried to argue with the Lord? He told me things about myself that I didn't know, and I tried to argue with him. I'm, that's not me. I'm not that. I'm going to be this. And you know what? He was absolutely right. Hmm. No doubt Peter also recalled the astonishing words of Mary Magdalene. You remember when... She ran to the tomb and it was empty and she ran back to the disciples where they were and she announced this empty tomb. Listen, 
Here are the words that she was given. The angel spoke to her. She ran back to where the disciples were. And you can find this in, if you're a note, note taker and you're taking notes today, Mark 16, verses 6 and 7. Here's what it says. And he, the angel, said to them, Do not be amazed. You are looking for Jesus, the Nazarene, who has been crucified. He is risen. He is not here. Behold, here is the place where they laid him. But go tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you to Galilee. Lord of hosts will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But do not fear because I'm going ahead of you to Galilee. And Mary brings that message back to Peter. Make sure you tell the disciples and Peter specifically. I'm going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you doesn't say it in the scripture but it it could very easily have said just a couple of days ago (laughs) now the fourth thing is closely related to the third point of boasting feeds the flesh it creates a false sense of security and self-assurance is this pride makes us deaf to god's word Pride makes us deaf to God's word, even as it's spoken to us. And and understand this, brothers and sisters. We receive the word of God and an understanding of the word of God by the agency and the power and the working of the Holy Spirit in our lives. That's how we receive it and understand it. But we can become deaf to that. We can become deaf to the Holy Spirit. And I encourage you, A couple of weeks ago now, I encouraged you to read John chapter 13. We're going to look at a couple of paths. Well, let's just turn there now. John chapter 13. Let's look at a couple of these verses. Well, more than a couple. The last time we studied Mark um, chapter 14, I told you that John 13 contains a lot of details that Mark 14 leaves out. So I want to look at this a little closer. John 13. Amen? Let's start at verse 1. Set the context. Now before the feast of the Passover, Jesus, knowing that his hour had come, that he would depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During supper, the devil, having already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come forth from God and was going back to God, got up from the supper and laid aside his garments and taking a towel, he girded himself. Then he poured water into the basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. Now, I told you last time that I think that Jesus did that right as the disciples started to argue about who was the greatest in the kingdom. Remember from from Mark's gospel and then from Luke's gospel that that part of the Last Supper was they were washing hands. It was ceremonial cleansing, but it also was for sanitation reasons, washing their hands before they eat. And then they started talking about who had the cleaner hands before they got started. (laughs) Who's going to be the greatest? Well, you you got more. I mean, you know, I saw what you did yesterday. So they started arguing about who's... and, And Jesus went into this whole... A dialogue about, listen, the Gentiles lorded over people. That's not so in the kingdom. It's not for you because the greatest shall be the servant. If you want to be great in the kingdom of God, then you're going to be the least. And so right after that, he gets up and demonstrates that by washing their feet. Skip down to verse 21. So Jesus has this conversation with them about the significance of washing their feet, service, and humility. Verse 21, when Jesus had said this, he became troubled in spirit and testified and said, Truly, truly, I say to you that one of you will betray me. The disciples began looking at one another at a loss to know of which one he was speaking. Jump down to 
26, Jesus then answered, that is the one for whom I shall dip the morsel and give it to him. So when he had dipped the morsel, he took and gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. After the morsel, Satan then entered into him. Therefore, Jesus said to him, what you do, do quickly. Jump down to verse 30. So after receiving the morsel, he went out immediately, and it was night. Therefore, when he had gone out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself, and will glorify him immediately. Little children, I am with you a little while longer. You will seek me, and as I said to the Jews, now I also say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this all men will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered, where I go, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow later. Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you right now? I will lay down my life for you. Jesus answered, will you lay down your life for me? Truly, truly, I say to you, a rooster will not crow until you deny me three times. Back to Mark 14. So Jesus had already told Peter once before we get to the passage in Mark 14 that you're going to deny me three times. This was the second time we just read it in Mark 14. This was the second time that Jesus told Peter he was going to falter. He was going to lose courage. But Peter paid no attention to that warning. He blew right through it. Now, it would be easy to pause and and finish the rest of our time this morning on that subject alone. How many times do we hear a word from the Lord? Do we get a check in our spirit? Does the Holy Spirit warn us? And we keep moving full steam ahead. How many times have you sensed in your spirit the Lord says, I wouldn't do that? I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't say that. I wouldn't take that action. I wouldn't respond. And we do it anyway. Spiritual deafness leads us to believe that we are the lone exception to the attacks of the enemy. Ah, I'm, I'm fine. I'm strong. I can do this. I can handle this. Note again, Verse 29 of Mark 14, even though all may fall away, yet I will not. I'm the exception. I'm stronger than everybody else. Apparently, this conversation consumed the time that it took for them to walk the streets of Jerusalem through the Eastern Gate, down the Kidron Valley, up the slope of the Mount of Olives, and they arrive at the Garden of Gethsemane. Notice verse 32, they came to a place named Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here until I have prayed. Gethsemane means oil press or olive press, which is appropriate given that it's located on the Mount of Olives, right? But it also provides a word picture. You know, I love word pictures. And so you think about a press, an olive press, an oil press. The olives would be put into this press And the wheel would be cranked down, and those olives would be distressed to the point of their flesh being rendered, tore, destroyed, disfigured. And the oil would be released as a result of that. What a picture that is of the passion of our Christ. So Jesus instructs the disciples to wait for him near the entrance of Gethsemane. That's verse 33. And he took with him Peter and James and John and began to be very distressed and troubled. Now, another astonishing statement, I think, Jesus makes to the disciples. Notice verse 34. And he said to them, my soul is deeply grieved to the point of death remain here and watch. They had never heard those words from his mouth. Never. Jesus was always the encourager. Jesus was always the optimist. 
Jesus was always the one that had a good and kind word to say to those that were in need. Very direct, very, I'll say, harsh words to the religious leaders. And why was that? Why did he talk that way to the religious leaders? Because they were the ones that Jesus characterized as people who think they don't need a physician. You think you're healthy and you're fine, and he meant that in a spiritual sense. And so he was always a harsh critic of the religious leaders who thought that their own self-righteousness was acceptable to God. He was trying to point out the fact that it wasn't. And if we rely on our own goodness, as Jesus' point, we're going to bust hell's gates wide open. Because this isn't about who we are or what's in us. It's about who Jesus is and when he comes into our lives. Amen? And so he makes this shocking statement in verse 34, my soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here. And that statement was quickly followed by the act itself. He demonstrated that he meant what he said. Notice verse 35, he went a little further beyond them and fell to the ground. The picture is he cast himself to the ground. He just fell in a heap and began to pray that if it were possible, the hour might pass him by. Wow. We're witnesses here. As we look at this gospel, we are witnesses to the humanity of Jesus. There he was facing an, an, an indescribable judgment as the innocent, spotless, sinless Son of Man. And in his agony, he sought the Father's mercy, verse 36, and he was saying, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not I will, but what you will. Mm. Even more than God's mercy, Jesus wanted to do the will of the Father. Aren't you glad for that? Amen. Amen. And what are Peter, James, and John doing while Jesus is in this distressed, grieved of spirit? Verse 37. And he came and found them sleeping. Said to Peter, Simon, don't miss this. Because remember, Peter's given Mark the information. And Peter says to Mark, and when he came and found me asleep and he called me by my surname. That'd be like your mother calling you by your full name, right? Now, for me, it was Charles Michael. And that may be a newsflash to some of you. My first name's Charles. Charles Michael, did you know you were in trouble when, when your mother used your first and middle name together in the same sentence? Yeah. Well... Jesus addresses Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not keep watch for one hour? Keep watching and praying that you may not come into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, he went away and prayed, saying the same words. And again, he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were very heavy. And they did not know what to answer him. And he came the third time and said to them, are you still sleeping and resting? It is enough. The hour has come. Behold, the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up. Let us be going. Behold, the one who betrays me is at hand. Wow. Well, let me conclude this this way. Notice in verse 38, we see Jesus addressing the necessity of being awake and being alert by saying that unless we are, we're going to fail the tests that's what he's pointing out here to Simon and to all of the disciples. And he says, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. There's a principle there, and we see it run throughout the scriptures, brothers and sisters. We mean well, but we often allow the flesh to win out over our good intentions. That's the principle. Paul captures this perfectly in his letter to the Galatians. Note takers, Galatians 5, verses 16 and 17. Paul says this, but I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. For the flesh sets its desire against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. 
How many of you know there's a battle going on in your spirit and your flesh every day of your life? The flesh wants you to do stuff, and the spirit's saying, no, let's stay on the, the narrow path, shall we? Let's walk Let's walk in righteousness. Let's walk in holiness. Let's walk under the power and by the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And we can do this thing. How many of you understand that if you step out from under the will of the Father in the direction leading and anointing of the Holy Spirit that you're walking in the flesh? How many of you understand that the flesh is awful tempting? Especially the fleshly desire to use our mouth. That we want, man, we want to just rip into somebody. We want to give them, and I still, this, I, I don't, I need to study the history of this phrase. We want to give people a piece of our minds. I would just say that some people don't have a piece to spare, so you should probably just keep your mouth shut. But that's a whole nother story. The reason uh, that I share this and I bring it down, and we are out of time, folks. Not quite, well, we'll wrap it up. It was very likely the third time we've just read it here, and the third time that Jesus came back and he said it's enough. Prior to that is when we read in the other Gospels, Luke 22. You can read this on your own. Luke 22 says that he was sweating great drops of blood, but that an angel came and strengthened him. And I think it was at that time, that third time, just before he came back, that he, that he was filled with, filled with a desire to do the will of the Father. And that strengthened and encouraged him such that, notice, before he was grieving and despairing, collapsed on the ground and praying, but now we, we, what we see in verse 41, he said to them, Are you still it is enough, the hour has come. Behold, the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up, let us be going. Strength and resolve. Fortitude. We're going to meet this challenge head on. Jesus knew what was coming, and he stared it straight in the eye. I'm going to Calvary's cross. Can you imagine knowing the beating and the torture that he was going to undergo? He knew it was coming, and he said, bring it on. Wow. What does that do for us in this day in which we live? We'll never face what Jesus faced, ever. But he still gives us his strength. He still goes ahead of us. He's there where you're headed. Can you grasp that? So when that trial, that temptation, that testing comes upon you, in that moment, understand Jesus is there. He's wanting to empower and strengthen and encourage you to handle whatever it is. You may be going some, through something right now in the present. Guess what? Jesus is there. He wants you to overcome it, which is going to win the spirit of the flesh. With God, all things are possible, right? Choose life. That's what the scripture says. Choose life that it may go well with you. Amen? We serve a risen Savior. We serve a risen Savior. Here's what Hebrews 5, 7 says. Because the writer of the Hebrews spoke about this very night, this beautiful, scandalous night that we sang about. Hebrews 5, 7, note takers. In the days of his flesh, he offered up both prayers and supplications with loud crying and tears to the one able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his holiness. God will get you through any trial or tribulation that you have by his power. Not our self-assurance, not our boasting, not our strength, but by his power, he will get you through it. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day that we celebrate, commemorate, praise you for our risen Lord Jesus. Thank you, Jesus for going to Calvary's cross in our place. 
Thank you, Holy Spirit, for bringing us into saving faith. Father, we thank you for your great plan. We thank you for your word. We thank you for preserving it for us. We thank you for encouraging us this morning to fight the good fight for as many days as you have given us here on this earth. Until you tarry, or for as long as you tarry, Lord, may we be found faithful. Thank you for that, Lord. Thank you for this body of believers that you continue to provide for. We're so very blessed by you, Lord. We love you, Father. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. The Lord bless thee. The Lord bless thee. And keep thee. And keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee. And be gracious unto thee. And be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up up his countenance countenance upon thee and give thee peace. Have a blessed resurrection day. Amen.